In this lecture, we will study the network layer. This is module 8 of the Cisco Introduction to Networks lecture series. If you would like to learn about other modules, I will leave a link in the description for the lecture series playlist and you can go ahead and check it out in my YouTube channel. We will cover the network layer characteristics, the IPv4 packet, the IPv6 packet, how a host routes, and the router routing tables. Network layer characteristics. So remember on the OSI module, model, the network layer is the third layer from the bottom. So we have physical, data link, trans, uh, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. So when they are communicating between host, now we are looking at the layer called network layer, which is on top of the data link layer and just below the transport layer. Network layer protocols forward encapsulated transport layer PDUs between the host. So that is a very important concept. So just remember that um, term. So the, the, this concept, so the network layer protocols forward encapsulated transport layer PDUs between hosts. So it uh, the network layer is responsible for that transport of the PDUs between the host. Network layer provides services to allow end devices to exchange data. IPv4 and IPv6 are the principal network layer communication protocols. In our previous modules, we briefly look at how IPv4 different from IPv6, and the network layer used those two protocols uh, for communication. The network layer performs four basic operations, addressing and devices, encapsulation, routing, and de-encapsulation. IP encapsulation. IP encapsulates the transport layer segment. IP can use either IPv4 or IPv6 packet and not impact the layer 4 segment. IP packet will be examined by all layer 3 devices as it travels the network. IP addressing does not change from source to destination. So remember, when you are communicating within a LAN, and when it is going across multiple switches or routers within the LAN network itself, the source and destination IP addresses does not change and until it actually goes through some kind of a NAT. So that's what it says on the bottom. A NAT will change addressing, but will it will be discussed in a later module. But for now, what you need to remember is when you are communicating between two uh, end devices within a LAN network, the IP address, the source and destination address does not change. And NAT is basically network address translation. Uh, that is the function of your, for example, your home router that allow you to connect to the internet. And again, we will discuss this in a later module. What are the characteristics of IP? IP is meant to have low overhead and may be described as connectionless, best effort, and media independent. I will go through each one of them in depth in the next few slides, but for now just remember those are the three important things about IPs. So the first one he says IP is connectionless. IP does not establish a connection with the destination before sending the packet. There is no control information needed, such as synchronizations, acknowledgements, etc. The destination will receive the packet when it arrives, but no pre-notifications are sent by IP. So basically, the sender doesn't need to let the receiver know that they, 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 there is a packet coming towards them. There is no pre-notification needed. If there is a need for connection oriented traffic, then another protocol will handle this, such as TCP, uh, which is at the transport layer. And we will also talk about TCP and UDP in a different uh, module. Uh, but for IP uh, protocol, it is connectionless. It doesn't need 
to let the receiver know that there is a packet with particular IPs arriving at their destination. Best effort. IP is best effort. IP will not guarantee delivery of the packet. IP has reduced overhead since there are no mechanism to resend data that is not received. IP does not expect acknowledgement. So IP packets doesn't expect uh, the receiver to acknowledge that the packet has been received. IP does not know if the other device is operational or if it is received the packet. In other words, just like mentioned before, it doesn't matter for the sender whether the packet has been received by the receiver. It doesn't receive any confirmation back from the receiver at all. And the IP is media independent. IP is unreliable. It cannot manage or fix undelivered or corrupt packets, as I mentioned before. It cannot retransmit after an error. IP cannot uh, realign out of uh, sequence packets. And IP must uh, rely on uh, other protocols for these functions, such as TCP, for example. IP is media independent. IP does not concern itself with the type of frame required at the data link layer or the media type at physical layer. IP can be sent over any media type such as fiber, copper or wireless. So the IP packet can travel through a copper wire, wireless, fiber optics, uh, any media because it's just IP is uh, able to operate on or any of the media types. The network layer will establish the maximum transmission unit or MTU. Network layer receives this information control uh, uh, information uh, sorry network layer receives this from the control information sent by the data link layer. The network then establish the MTU size. Fragmentation is when layer 3 splits the IPv4 packet into smaller units. Uh, fragmenting causes latency and IPv6 does not fragment packets. For example, router uh, goes from Ethernet to a slower WAN uh, with a smaller MTU that will result in fragmentation. So if you have a router that is connected to a fiber optic high speed line, but your internal networks are copper, uh, that may cause fragmentation uh, in uh, IP transmission. That's all you need to remember for your exams and quizzes for this module uh, when it's comes to my fragmentation because we are not going to go into depth of how fragmentation works in this particular module, but we will in the future. The IPv4 packet. The IPv4 packet header um, have a couple of things that you should uh, be aware of. Uh, IPv4 is the primary communication protocol for the most networks uh, layers um, in modern day. The network header has many purposes. Uh, they are uh, one of uh, three of those would be it en ensures the packet is sent in the correct direction from you know sender to the destination. It contains information for network layer processing in various fields. The information in the header is used by layer 3 devices that handle the packet. So those are a couple of things, you know, three things that the IPv4 packet header does. And we will look into a little bit uh, in depth on all of them uh, in next few slides. The IPv4 packet header uh, has the uh, following characteristics. It is binary. It contains several fields of information and typically it is read uh, like when you look at a, when you try to represent that on a piece of paper like this it is read from uh, left to right and four bytes per line the most common uh, and the most not the most common the most important fields are the source and destination address remember uh, every packet must contain the source and destination and those are very important uh, for uh, operation of uh, packet switching. So that is the most important part of the IPv4 uh, packet headers. 
protocols may have one or more functions uh, when uh, you know when used with other uh, protocols uh, and again i will go into depth in a different module uh, when i talk about that but for now or if you just look at your right hand side you have a diagram of a ipv4 packet and you can understand uh, by looking at it that we have a destination address and the source ip address those are the most important things and then we have the time to leave protocol uh, checksum identification the flags uh, and uh, you know everything else and we will go into depth of uh, a ipv4 header uh, uh, soon after but for now just remember those are the items that you will see on ipv4 header so what you need to remember for this course and this particular module is the significant fields in the ipv4 header those are version, differentiated services, header checksum, time to leave or TTL, the protocol, the source IPv4 address, and destination IPv4 address. So those are the important things that you should get out of it. I will show you another diagram uh, comparing IPv4 and IPv6 headers, and you should also familiar with uh, the differences between the two headers. Uh, so for IPv4 packet headers, what you need to remember is there's a version. Uh, this will be IPv4 as opposed to IPv6 with a 4-bit field. And there's a differentiator services such as used by QoS, uh, diff serve field, etc, uh, etc, et TOS also. Uh, and uh, header checksum which detect a corruption in the IPv4 header. Remember it's like a fingerprint. Um, time to leave it's a layer 3 hop count when it becomes zero the counter sorry the router will discard the packet uh, so the you know you don't get congestion with having a lot of packets that are never used in the network so that's being controlled by the time to leave or ttl the protocol uh, is the id's next level protocol uh, such as icmp tcp udp etc so it, it will like given what data contained within that protocol header uh, the packet will know that you know what type of protocol it is going to be used in by the next level uh, for example icmp is 1 tcp 6 udp is 17. you should actually know these numbers for your exams and quizzes and you should know each one of them you know what what they do like each one of these sections and the source ip address which is a 32-bit uh, source address and the destination IPv4 address, which is also a 32-bit address. So this is going to be the, your source and destination addresses. Those are the very important ones because if they don't have one of either one of them, the source or destination, the the packet is not valid, right? So that's very important for delivery of the packet. So let's compare the IPv4 and IPv6 headers briefly, uh, even though we don't go into depth of each one of them. So the IPv4 header on your left hand side, you can see that and the IPv6 header on your right hand side, you can see on the right hand side diagram. On the IPv4 header, we have the source and destination address, just like IPv6 header also have the source and destination IPv6 address. So it has IPv4 source and destination and this one has IPv6 source and destination address. Notice both of them do have the source and destination IP addresses. However, the bit counts, like how big those addresses are different because IPv4 is 32 bit and IPv6 is 100, 128 bits. And there are some fields in IPv4 that is not found in IPv6, such as the header checksum, the options and padding information, uh, the identification, the IHL, etc., etc. But there are items that you always find other items, such as, for example, version. So, see, there's a version header up here and version header up here. And also, there are some headers in IPv6 and IPv4, both common to each other, but the position of the header is different, such as, for example, uh, the uh, if you look at, uh, for example, in here, we have the total length and total length over here, we, we call it like, you know, payload length instead of saying total length is kind of like a payload length. So a TTL, time to leave, 
is in IPv4, but in IPv6, we call it hop limit. So kind of TTL and hop limit doing the similar functions, uh, the position of which is on the header is different and also naming convention is different. So do you need to know the differences between IPv4 and IPv6 headers for this particular class? Um, yes, I would say at least you should have a very good idea about how IPv4 and IPv6 headers are different in this class. Uh, otherwise, you might um, not understand all the concepts that we will be covering in our future lectures. So this slide is a very important slide. You should either pause it and come back here and check it out uh, because that will give you a better idea about the differences between IPv4 and IPv6 headers. There's a video on your Cisco Netacad uh, that uh, look into the IPv4 headers in Wireshark. Uh, Wireshark will allow you to examine those uh, packets in depth. Uh, however, if you do not have access to the Cisco Netacad, I have posted a copy of that video uh, on my YouTube channel. I will leave it in our uh, description of this uh, video uh, and you can go ahead and check it out. But if you do have access to Cisco Netacad, just go ahead and you can check the video called Sample IPv4 Headers in Wireshark or go to my YouTube channel and search this or check the link in my description. IPv6 packets. Limitations of IPv4 uh, are that we have a global um, depletion of IPv4 addresses. So we basically ran out of IPv4 addresses because everybody have a cell phone, everybody have a connected device and most devices in the world uh, now are connected to a network. And there are more and more people around the world in developing countries are now being connected to uh, internet and networks. So we are literally actually running out of IPv4 addresses. The other one is the lack of end-to-end -end connectivity. Uh, so to make IPv4 survive this long to 2022, uh, private addressing and network created. This ended uh, direct communications with public addressing. So what that basically means is um, when you have a router at your home provided by let's say your service provider, the your internal IP addresses are different from your uh, external IPs. So when you communicate to the internet, let's say you are sitting on in front of a computer and you access the Google, for example, google.com or sanuja.com. When you access sanuja.com, what happened is your local computer, which has a local IP address such as like 192.168.5.10, for example, go to the router and then the router will use the network address translation or called NAT to communicate to the internet using its, its external IP address saying, hey, this guy needs sanuja.com website delivered to its computer. And then what's gonna happen is that the external site doesn't see your internal IP address. It is being translated through network address translation called NAT through your router. So we will go into depth of this uh, later um, in a later um, lecture. But for now, what you need to understand is NAT actually separates the internal and external networks in, at the IP level, especially. And as a result, it increased the network complexity. So NAT was meant as a temporary solution and creates issues on the network as a side effect of manipulating the network header addressing. As a result, so the NAT is causing more network complexity that we really don't need. And NAT also causes latency and some troubleshooting issues. Let's look at an overview of IPv6. IPv6 was developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force or e, sorry, IETF. IPv6 uh, overcomes the limitations of IPv4. It improves addressing space and it improves the packet handling and it eliminates the need for the NAT. So how it goes about increasing the addressing space is that we are switching from having 32 bits uh, in IPv4 to 128 bits addresses in IPv6, which is significantly increasing the number of IP addresses that can be uh, assigned. Like for example, IPv4 will be around that and IPv6 is around that. So IPv6 can provide 340 
under cillion number of IP addresses as opposed to IPv4 just 4 billion. It improves packet handling because it simplifies the header with fewer fields and we don't even need network address translation since there is a huge amount of addressing and there is no need to use private addressing internally because we now we have um, way more than uh, what we needed. IPv4 packet header fields in the IPv6 packet header. The IPv6 header is simplified but not smaller. The header is fixed at 40 bytes or octet long. However, some IPv4 fields were removed to improve performance such as flag, fragment, uh, fragment offset and header checksum. So on the, your right hand side, uh, you have a, a diagram of uh, a packet header. And again, we'll go into the depth of this uh, in next few slides a little bit. Significant fields in the IPv4 header. So we went over this before. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go over this again. So we have the version, traffic class, flow label, play, payload length, next header, hop limit, source IPv4 address and destination IPv4 address. I went over uh, the descriptions before in a previous slide, so I'm just gonna skip through this, but just remember these are the significant fields in IPv4 header. The IPv6 packet may also contain extension headers or EH. EH headers uh, have the characteristics of um, providing optional network layer information and they are optional and are placed between IPv6 header and the payload and may be used for fragmentation, security, mobility, support, etc. Unlike IPv4, the routers do not fragment IPv6 packets. That's a very key concept that you should remember. Unlike IPv4, the routers do not fragment the IPv6 packets. Again, there is a video in your uh, Cisco NetAcad if you have registered with an uh, academic institution or you have access to Cisco NetAcad, uh, the video called uh, Sample IPv6 Headers in Wireshark. But if you do not have access to uh, Cisco NetAcad, I will leave a link below in the description and I have posted uh, to my YouTube channel the same video so that you can go ahead and watch it and learn it. Uh, if you are currently going through this lecture, I would recommend pausing this video and check that video first and then come back to the complete the module. How are host routes? Host forwarding decision. Packets are always created at the source. Each host device creates their own routing table. A host can send packets to the following. So the host can send it to itself. We call that a loopback. So IPv4 loopback gonna be 172.0.0.1 and IPv6 gonna be these two dots and one and that will be IPv6. Uh, so ping, like if you ping 127.0.0.1, that is a testing the IP TCP IP stack on the device that is working correctly. So we just checking the device itself to see if the TCP IP stack is working on the device itself. We can ping 172.0.0.1 in IPv4, for example. Local host. Destination is on the same LAN. We'll have that those local hosts and the remote host, which are devices that are not on the same LAN. So like, for example, in this diagram, a local host is going to be like in the same LAN. So you're going to have 192.168.10.15 here and 192.168.10.10 here. So these are local hosts right here because it's behind the, you know, one side of the router, which will have a port associated with 192.168.10.1, for example. A remote host is going to be something that is after that NAT translation or after that router, in this case on the right hand side, and that would have a different IP address and different subnet. Just in case you guys are wondering what are subnets, uh, we will talk about that in depth in a different video and a different lecture. Um, 
just remember like same subnet basically means this uh, the address with the first one two three the third one two three all these three octets are the same so 192.168.10 is dot 10 and 192.168.10.15 dot 15 are in the same subnet on the same network uh, and that what make it actually one of the reasons why it is a local host as opposed to a remote host so this one could have like 192.172.5.1 for example so that going to be a completely different subnet and it is outside that network and again we will go into depth of those subnets and how how you can create uh, variable subnets in a different video um, for now just remember uh, local host versus remote host that's the that's how you distinct them this uh, distinguish between them the source device determines whether the destination is local or remote method of determination in IPv4, the source uses its own IP address and subnet mask along with the destination IP address. So as I mentioned before, the subnets are important, play an important role here. And then the IPv6 sources uh, use the network address and prefix advertised by the local router. Local traffic is dumped out of the host interface to be handled by an in intermediary device. Remote traffic is forwarded directly to the default gateway on the LAN. This is a very important concept for your exams and quizzes. So remember, both in IPv4 and IPv6, the local traffic is dumped out of the host interface to be handled by the intermediary device. But however, the remote traffic is forwarded directly to the default gateway on the LAN. Default gateway. This is also a very important device in your networks and it's very important that you understand what's a default gateway. A, def a router or layer three switch can be a default gateway. Features of a default gateway or DGW include it must have an IP address in the same range as the rest of the LAN. So if you have a 192.168.10.5 as a device, your default gateway should be around 192.168.10. something. So it should be one most likely going to be 192.168.10.1, for example. So it has to be in the same range of the rest of the LAN. It can accept data from the LAN and is capable of forwarding traffic off of the LAN. So it can reach internet or some other LAN network that is not internal internal. It can route to other networks. So those are the three things you must have in a default gateway. If a device has no default gateway or a bad default gateway, its traffic will not be able to leave the LAN. So this is very important. If a device has no default gateway or a bad default gateway, that means you were given an incorrect uh, default gateway IP address or information to the that end device, its traffic, that end device traffic, will not be able to leave the LAN. So to send the packet to host on the same network, host sends ARP messages to get MAC of the other host and it can communicate using just the MAC address, right? We learned that in our previous module. But to send a packet to a host on a different network it requires a default gateway so what it's going to do is the uh, host going to communicate with the default gateway and up to get the mac address of the default gateway instead of the mac address of the next host because it doesn't know the mac address of the next the host that that need to be communicated right so i'm going to repeat that again when the host is sending a message to another host within the same network, it can use the app to get the MAC address of that host in the same network and then just communicate. But however, when the host is trying to communicate to a remote host, a host that is not within their network, it's going to send the uh, app request looking for the MAC address of the default gateway. And then the default gateway is responsible for communicating with that outside world. So the host must be given the IP address of the default gateway in order to communicate with the outside world. Gateway is a router 
must be on the same network as the host as I mentioned before and the router know how to reach other networks. The router on your network is your gateway to other networks. So in another way to uh, remember this for your exams and to understand the concept, the router on your network is your gateway to other networks, you know, that is may not be internal. A host routes to the default gateway. The host will know the default gateway or DGW either statistically or through DSCP in IPv4. IPv6 sends the uh, default gateway through a router solicitation or RS or can be configured manually. A DGW or default gateway is status, uh, a static route which will be a last resort route in the routing table. All device on the LAN will need the DGW of the router if the intent to send if it if they intend to send the traffic remotely remember on my previous slide i described explained this so if the host is communicating within their internal network they don't even need the router they can send a packet from pc1 to pc2 without going through router but if the host is trying to communicate to a remote network it do, it does need the uh, default gateway information so that it can send the packet to this port in the router so it can use that information to communicate to the remote networks. So that's what it's saying here. Host routing tables. On Windows, route print or net stat with dash R to display, you can display the routing tables. So on a Windows machine, uh, this is what a routing table look like. You can uh, go and you know check it out on your own Windows computer. Uh, you can go netstat dash r, and that will give you the uh, the routing table uh, you have on your computer. Three sections display by these two uh, routing commands: uh, either netstat dash r or route print. Uh, they are interface list. IPv4 routing and IPv6 routing. The interface list is the all potential interfaces and MAC addresses. Like for example, you will have the network destination information and all the interface information associated with here. So that would be the interfaces right here. And you will see the default gateway and you will have the network destination addresses. And, and those are IPv4 or IPv6 addresses. And these two commands, the route print and netstat r are some, some of the commands that you will be using as network administrators or uh, network developers uh, on the field to sometimes troubleshoot issues. But for now, for this particular course, you just need to know those commands exist and how to look them up. And we will go into depth of uh, troubleshooting and advanced network configurations on our later lectures. Introduction to routing. Layer 3 router. Do not forward broadcast. Each interface is in a different broadcast domain. It learns path to other networks by exchanging information. The network layer provides services to direct packets to a destination host on another network. And to travel, uh, to other networks, the packet must be processed by a router. The role of the router is set to select paths for the direct packet forward the destination host in a process known as routing. So the role of the router is to select paths for the direct packet forward to the destination host in the process called routing. That's where the term routing comes from. And each router, the packet takes to reach the destination host is called a hop. So you will hear that these terms uh, during these lectures and this course, uh, things like routing, next hop, hop, 
uh, and broadcast domain. And this this is where I, all of these some of these terms come from. And again, don't worry too much about all of this information, but remember that we are covering this information, and you should have a ba at least a basic idea at this point. Uh, you know uh, what this means. So that's the whole point of this uh, particular slide. Uh, you can pause this video and quickly go over this if you would like to have a brief summary. And that's what this is. Router packet forwarding decision. What happened when the router receives the frame from the host device? So you have a host device, which is PC10, sorry, PC1, which has the 192.168.10.10. And what happened when the router received that frame, right? So the packet arrives on the router's port. Uh, in this case, it's gonna be the G000 interface. And then that R1 de-encapsulate the layer two uh, ethernet header and the trailer. Then the router one examine the destination IPv4 address of the packet and searches for the best match IPv4 routing table and the router entry indicates that the packet is to be forwarded to router 2. So this this packet gets being sent through the switch uh, to the router but because the initial host have a, have a default gateway associated with this right hand side of the sorry left hand side of the r1 which has the 192.168.10.1 the router one now is responsible uh, for examining the destination ipv4 address for that packet then it's going to search for that destination uh, ipv4 address and look for the best match uh, in its ipv4 routing table and then it's going to route based on that information and then the router one encapsulate the packet into a new ethernet header and trailer and forward that packet to the next hop, which is gonna be the router two. So the first hop is gonna be here. So when the packet was sent initially from the host, the first hop gonna be here in right here in the router one. And then the next hop gonna be the router two because the router two uh, left hand side interface, which is 209.165.200.226 going to receive that packet. So you could actually look at this as like a, uh, this is your home router and this is the router uh, of a remote um, connection, for example. So that's what it's showing. And the routing table uh, of R1 going to be, you're gonna have a bunch of um, IP addresses and associated next hop uh, exit interfaces and what they are doing in router one is actually matching those route routing uh, IP addresses which with the next hop uh, interface and forwarding that to the next hop. So I know this can be a little bit confusing this particular slide, but just go over it one couple of times and you will understand what exactly been uh, trying to be I'm trying to deliver here. So what the, what the key concept here is that when the packet arrives on the first router, it de-encapsulate and look for the matching IPv4 ad address in the routing table for forwarding for the next hop so that it can forward the packet to the next hop. So that's the very key, the key information you should get out of this slide. There are three types of routes in a router's routing table. Directly connected, remote, and default route. The directly connected are routes that are automatically added by the router, provided the interface is active and has addressing. So they are directly connected to the router itself. Remote, uh, these are the routes, uh, the router does not have a direct connection and may be learned through either manually by uh, a network administrator assigning uh, static routes, for example, or dynamic dynamically, uh, which is by using a routing protocol to have the routers share their information with each other. Default route is forward. Uh, this is uh, this is forward all traffic to a specific direction 
when there is no match in the routing table. So when the packet arrives and you don't have any IP address associated within the router's routing table, it used the default route to forward all traffic to a specific di direction. When they don't, don't know, when the router doesn't know where the packet needs to be forwarded. So this is a very important thing that you should know. So in IP router uh, routing table, we have three, one is uh, three con uh, major uh, routes, directly connected, remote and default route. And you should also know the differences be between uh, each one of them. And uh, a default route look like this uh, on your Cisco uh, router or Cisco devices. Either it's a, a router or layer three a switch, you'll be able to get default route information by typing show IP route. And you're gonna come up with a bunch of uh, information. Um, the, some of the key things that you will be looking at is such as the static route. And then uh, you will see in here, the static route is the default. And then we have the static route set to uh, this, uh, this particular setup. Uh, by just typing show IP route. This is just to give you a quick overview of what it looks like on a Cisco device. And on the next slide, I will go a little bit in depth into this. But for now, because we are not doing a lab right now, um, you just need to know how to you know search it up, the default routes. Um, I will do a lab and post a video on my, my YouTube channel on a later day. Uh, but for now, just remember uh, some basic information that you can get out of by typing show IP route command on your Cisco router. And the next slide I will look in, we will look into this a little bit depth. So you always read from left to right. So what we did here is we took this, like this particular one line and we're gonna examine that in a little bit in depth so that you'll have a better idea when you are going to do your labs. So the O is a route learned by OSPF routing protocol. What is OSPF routing protocol? You don't need to know right now because you just get started working on learning about networks. This course is introduction to networks, but when we go move forward in our future lectures, we I will discuss and how or, uh, OSPF works, but for now O means in here is it's it's a route learned by OSPF routing protocol. 10.1.1.0, which IP address shown here, is the destination network address. And then you see this uh, value within a bracket, 110 slash two, where 110 is the administrative distance or AD, and how trustworthy that router path is. And the two is the metric which is how far the network is. And then we have a uh, IP address again, right after the, we are here, and which is 192.168.200.226, which is the packet is passing <coughs> to the next hop address. So this is the next hop address we have here. So this is the destination network address, and this is the next hop address. And then finally, we have the uh, gigabit ethernet 001, this 001 is the interface of the exit. So that's the exit interface. So concepts such as what is OSPF and what is uh, administrative distance AD and uh, uh, you know trustworthy um, path and etc. All of these things, I will go into depth in a different video, but just for now, just know how to read it from left to right. If you were to run this show IP route command, in your Cisco device. So if you route, if you type show IP route on a Cisco router, you get this information and the static route is displayed with the S and the O here will give you the information about, for example, a OSPF routing protocol associated uh, items. Because Cisco follow the similar structure, uh, by knowing this basic information will help you in the future because it's gonna be the similar things but slightly different as we advance in this course. Static routing. Static route characteristics include uh, the following. 
it must be configured manually must be adjusted manually by the administrator when there is a change in topology so if you have a static route on a router and you decided to change your network you have to remember to go back to that router and change the static route information otherwise it won't be able to automatically obtain because it is a manually configured item static routes are always going to be a manually configured item uh, it, they are good for small or uh, small uh, non redundancy non redundant networks like a home office or a small business with internal networks often used in conjunction with a dynamic routing protocol for uh, configuring default routes so you can use static routes along with the dynamic um, routing and that's how most often you're going to see it you know we probably never going to see just a static route you're probably going to see static route along with some dynamic uh, routing protocols and on the right hand side i just basically give you a basic idea of how static route and dynamic routes work and um, I'm not going to go over this diagram. You can force this uh, video and quickly go over it if you would like to have a little bit of better visual diagram of how it works. But for now, for this course, for this particular module, what you need to remember is static routes are manually configured and typically used in conjunction with a dynamic uh, uh, routing. And if you change anything on your network and you have manually configured static routes within your network uh, routers, you have to go back to those routers and manually reconfigure them because static routes are almost always uh, manually configured. They can't automatically, uh, you know, change that when you change the network. Dynamic routing. Dynamic routes automatically uh, discover remote networks automatically and it maintains up-to-date information and choose the best path to the destination. Find new best paths when there is a topology change. Dynamic routing can also share static default routes with the other routers. So what that means is basically if you have dynamic routes and there are no static routes, whenever you change your network configurations, you don't need to do anything to your routers. It will automatically discover the remote networks and maintain up-to-date information and choose the best path. But it also can find the best paths when there is a um, a st a static route, default route uh, with the other routers uh, by just communicating with them. So like if this one has, like router 2 has a, st a static route and the router 1 has dynamic routing and if this router 1 gets uh, exchanged or rebooted or changed, um, it will actually know uh, the, this one has a static route because this one has dynamic route and it will be able to figure that information out. And on the right hand side, again, this is a diagram provided by Cisco. You can pause this video and read this information to understand what it is. Again, I'm not going to go over it uh, just to save some time and I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, but however, I'm going to highlight what's important to know in dynamic routing is that it is automatic. So that's the most key important thing that you should take out of this slide for your exams. There is a video on your Cisco Netacad uh, with the title IPv4 Router Routing Tables. That video explains the information in the IPv4 routing table uh, in depth, a little bit in depth than what we went over. And um, I will leave a link below in my uh, YouTube channel uh, for a copy of this video in case you do not have access to Cisco Netacad, uh, either through registration with them or through your academic institution. Uh, if you um, if you are studying this module for the first time, I would recommend pausing this video, checking that video, uh, the, this uh, clip first, and then coming back to continue this lecture. Introduction to an IPv4 routing table. We briefly look at an, a routing table before in our previous slide, so I'm just going to go over a little bit more information with respect to that routing table. Uh, but not more so because this is going to be the uh, the last slide that we're going to look at this particular concept uh, but in the future modules i will come back to this concept so this is the last 
briefly introduction introducing what does this show ip route command will get you so the show ip route command shows the following route sources l right here is the directly connected local interface ip address c right here is the directly connected network s as we went over before which is the static route which was manually configured by an administrator right here o which we have went over which described the ospf and the d will we will be describing the eigrp uh, uh, protocols for now as i mentioned before you don't need to know what is ospf and eigrp what are their differences and how you going to configure them but just for now what you or you should know is by typing show ip route you might see these letters on the left hand side and what these letters means uh, you, you can just look at this slide and you will know what they means as you work through your cisco uh, carrier and you work through the cisco netacad modules uh you will familiar with this what they they exactly mean to the point that it will be in your back of your mind like it will be like you know it's like would be a second nature you don't even need this slide to know what s stand for for example uh this command shows uh types of routes uh such as you know directly connected such as cnl remote routes d uh, o etc and the default route which is s star so this is just a brief introduction to ipv4 routing table um as i mentioned before again and again and again when you do these labs uh, which i will be posting on my youtube channel later you will get used to seeing these letters and routing tables and you don't even need to come back to this slide you will remember like back of your hand so that brings us to the end of this lecture and we will go over quickly uh, what did we learn in this module we learned that the ip is connectionless best effort and media independent ip does not guarantee packet delivery ipv4 packet header consists of fields containing information about the packet ipv6 overcomes ipv4 lack of end to end connectivity and increased network complexity a device will determine if a destination itself another local host and a remote host like it can determine you know the destination going to be itself or another host or a remote host default gateway is router that is part of the lan and will be used as a door to other networks the routing table contains a list of all known network addresses like prefixes and we are to forward those packets the router uses longer subnet mask or prefix match the routing table has three types of route entries they are directly connected networks remote networks and default routes so those are the key concepts that we learn in this particular module and one of the key things i would like to emphasize even though the cisco uh, exams may not be uh, highlighting this is you should know the differences between ipv4 header and ipv6 header and how they are slightly different from each other um and uh, you know why we are using ipv6 now uh, as opposed to just keep using ipv4 because we ran out of ip addresses in ipv4 right so remember that so those are very key important concepts that's everything for today for this particular lecture if you have any questions or concerns related to this module or anything related to cisco netacad introduction to network series you are more than welcome to leave a comment below and i will do my best to get back to you and answer all your questions and make sure you go over all the covered uh, topics and items before you take your quiz or exams uh, because uh, i may have skipped through some of these things i may have gone through too fast so you can replay the video and go back to those slides uh, especially the important slides that you can uh, pause uh, and read those uh, information uh, make sure that you understand those concepts so that you will get a very high score on your exams 
please make sure to thumbs up and to this video and subscribe to my channel until next time have a nice day